we're now a recording in progress. Uh, and if you have any technical difficulties, please let us know uh, using the chat and Jeffrey Albright or myself will try and reach out to you um, as Sandra and Marita continue the conversation. Before I give a full introduction of both of them, I'd like to thank everybody for attending um, and to let you all know that the Peter Bola Foundation is currently accepting applications for our fall 2022 residencies. Uh, you can find out more information on the residencies tab of our website at peterbolofoundation.org. I'd also like to thank our local NAACP chapter and the Winchester Book Gallery for sharing this event. And finally, I'd like to share another event happening on Thursday of this week at 7 p.m. Uh, with our current artists uh, who are in residence right now, Ibtizan Zaman and Lauren Bacchus. Uh, they'll be discussing their work and the influences on it, which includes Lauren's Caribbean heritage and Ibtizan's multicultural upbringing. The event is free and registration is again available through our website. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Marita Golden. Marita is the author of 19 works of fiction and nonfiction. Her books include the novels, The Wide Circumference of Love, After, and The Edge of Heaven, and the memoirs, Migrations of the Heart, Saving Our Sons, and Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through the Color Complex, and the anthology which she edited, Us Against Alzheimer's, Stories of Family Love and Faith. Her most recent work of nonfiction is The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Writer, Writers for Writers Award presented by Barnes & Noble and Poets and Writers, an award from the Authors Guild, and the Fiction Award for her novel After, awarded by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She has lectured and read from her work internationally. Co-founder and President Emerita of the Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright Foundation, Marita Golden is a veteran teacher of writing. She taught at the University of Lagos in Nigeria and has served as a member of the faculties of the MFA Graduate Creative Writing Programs at George Mason University and Virginia Commonwealth University. She has served as Distinguished Writer in Residence uh, at the MA Creative Writing Program at Johns Hopkins University and Prince George's Community College and the University of the District of Columbia. As a literary consultant, she offers writing workshops, coaching, and manuscript evaluation services. And second, we have Sandra Jackson Apoku, our former artist in residence from November to December here at the Peter Bola Foundation. Sandra is the author of the award-winning novel, The River Where Blood is Born, and Hot Johnny and the Women Who Loved Him, an Essence Magazine bestseller. She co-edited the anthology, Revise the Psalm, working, work celebrating the writing of Gwendolyn Brooks. Her fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and dramatic works are widely published. Her honors include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, the Coordinating Council of Literary Magazines and General Electric Award for Younger Writers, an American Library Association Black Caucus Award, New City Lit 50, Who Really Books in Chicago 2020, a City of Chicago Esteemed Literary Artist Award and a Pushcart Prize nomination. We also just found out just before this call that Sandra has won another fellowship award. She has been a resident fellow at many national and international arts communities. She teaches literary, literature and writing workshops, uh, conferences, colleges, and universities across the country and around the world. Now, without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to the two of them. Thank you, Katie. Uh, first, I wanna thank the uh, Peter Bulla Foundation for the invitation, and I wanna thank Sandra, my old friend, we go back a long way, back to Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs> and uh, we've been mutual fans of each other's work and sister friends and supporters of, of everything to do with Black writing. So I'm really glad to be here tonight and in conversation with Sandra. And this is a book, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women that like a number of books, probably all the books I've written, I had no idea I was going to write. Its genesis is in a visit to my doctor's office, which reveals something about my health. And then as I want to do when I have a very powerful or sort of crucial experience, I find myself writing about it. This is a book that was written during the year of 2020, that seminal uh, crucial year, which we're still feel in a way that we're living through and it was a year in which the issues of health, mental health, and particularly the mental health of African-Americans 
was something that was on everybody's mind because of so many things were happening um, in the world. And I found myself writing this book. And when I was doing research, I was very pleased to find that there's a very vigorous, ongoing, expansive conversation among African-American women and African-descended women about the strong Black woman complex. That is, that belief that Black women kind of are invincible that because of our experience, our historical and even present day experience with systemic racism, we have to, in all situations, be strong, resilient, and um, basically be the primary caretakers for our families and our communities. And for our grandmothers and our mothers, that was a belief system that was an adaptation. But we now know that it's really was kind of a maladaptation. Because one of the things that we realize now is that Black women are in a health and mental health emergency. And some of that emergency is a direct result of the belief that Black women have to be strong all the time, that we can't ask for help. And the residual impact of all that on our physical and mental health. So I'm very glad to be enrolled in what is kind of a army, kind of a guerrilla army of writers and scholars and medical professionals and just ordinary women of all ages who are now saying that we have to talk about the toxic aspects of the belief that Black women are super women, always resilient, and that we can't set boundaries or ask for help. So when I was thinking about how I would write this book, I wrote it in, I decided to write it in a format that I call communal memoir. It's a format that I've used for books in the past. And I start out with my story and then I expand the story to interview other people, uh, scholars, experts. And because I'm a storyteller, I didn't want this to be a book that was all about the very negative statistics around black women's health. The fact that black women are the leading group developing dementia the fact that we have disproportionate amounts of diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, obesity, that is part of our story. And we have to realize it, face up to it, and develop practices and strategies to fight it. But we're more than that. We're survivors, we're mothers, we're sisters, and we are strong women emotionally and physically. So this is a book that has a lot of different voices in it. It does have statistics. I interview therapists, I interview doctors, but the, but the most uh, meaningful voices I like to say are the voices of ordinary black women talking about their experiences healing uh, through trauma, black women who talk about being in therapy. It's a book that has the voice of everything from me meditating on R. Kelly to a final essay about the beauty of the story, their eyes are watching God and how healing stories are. So before Sandra and I start our conversation, I wanted to just give you a little taste of the different voices that activate the book and that I've been very pleased uh, in the feedback I've gotten to the book, people really feel that they identify with and that mean a lot to them. The first voice is my own voice and the second voice will be that of a young woman who shared her story of what it meant to go into therapy to learn how to set boundaries. I was 21 years old and my mother was dying. She lay comatose in a bed in a rehabilitation center for six months, wasting away before my eyes. I was a raise the black power fist, Afro wearing militant activist and B plus average student attending American University. And I already started wearing the mask the strong black woman mask. I was 21 and already I knew that being a strong black woman meant that you handled your business. You did what you had to do no matter what. My mother was dying, but I had to continue to be a successful student. Being a strong black woman meant that you didn't bother others unnecessarily with your pain. In the small apartment where I lived with my mother, my nights were sleepless tear-filled meltdowns in which in the dark I whispered, shouted, and screamed, 
the questions I was terrified to ask in the light of day. Why would I soon be a motherless child? How would I go on? I'd rarely have ever seen my mother cry. Maybe she too cried in the dark. How I wish she cried in the light. Despite all that she'd made of her life after her arrival in Washington, DC, as part of the great migration of African-Americans from the South, there was a lot she could have cried about. And when I was looking for African-American women to talk to for this book, I really wanted to talk to Black women who had destigmatized going into therapy, who had destigmatized seeking professional help when they felt that they were in emotional and mental crisis. And the stories that these women told me were beautiful stories, um, stories that we need to talk about in the light of day, stories that really need to be normalized so that we can normalize caring for our mental health. This is an excerpt from uh, a section in the book where a young lady is, has shared with me what it meant to grow up in a family where there was alcoholism, where there's emo there was emotional abuse in her family's marriage, and where she was the designated anchor child. And I know that those of you in the audience know what that anchor child is like. In fact, some of you are probably anchors yourself. That is that designated child, often a girl, who is designated as strong, who bears the weight of much of the crisis and concern. And here she is talking about a part of her journey. No doubt, we were jacked up. We were a mess. But our church was where we all came together, no matter what. I remember when I was 10 years old, one Sunday, I went up to the sanctuary and a woman prayed over me. She affirmed my purpose and what God had in store for me. I'll never forget that. The memory of that woman's hands kept pushing me through everything. That and the family prayer line that my mother's side of the family set up and that I'm still a part of. My own faith, my mother's faith, all of that got me through everything. And everything included while in college, being the family breadwinner, using her scholarship money to buy food and pay household bills. Everything included watching her parents' 36 year marriage end, but because endings are rarely neat, seeing bitterness and distance and quarrels still erupt. Quote, because by then I was deeply into the superwoman, the strong black woman syndrome. All of this was my burden to carry, Jamie said. But in 19, she took the first steps to lay her burden down by going to counseling for adult children of alcoholics. Prayer led me to counseling. All my life, I'd been told not to share our business. But prayer helped me realize it was okay to seek professional counseling outside the church. She found faith to endure and overcome in church, but in group counseling, she could hear and see through the din and the fog of her life at home. She began to put the pieces together like a puzzle. Her father told her, stand up for yourself. Don't let white people keep you down. But that warning was followed by the accusation that she talked too much and had a smart mouth. Her mother said, be a proud black woman, be strong, I love you, but don't tell anybody our business. Tell me what you feel but I need you, you can handle this. You're the first one I call, the one I can always depend on. Jamie was crumbling beneath the burden, but in group therapy, that was one place where she could be herself, something she was still discovering. Jamie was crumbling beneath the burden and had what she would call the first honest conversation with her parents. I told them, I can't carry you. I can't carry my anger. I can't carry my hurt. She set boundaries and put herself first. I wasn't protected as a child, but now I was ready to protect myself. I told them, I love you, mom. I love you, dad, but I release you. I choose me. And I was very honored that these women would share their stories with me so openly and so honestly. And I know that one of the reasons they shared them so openly and honestly is because they knew that their stories would be part of a process of healing for other women who read them. Um, and I'm going to finish with reading a small section from what for me was probably the most creatively satisfying part of the book where I reimagined the stories of some of our most iconic sheroes, people like Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer. 
And I gave myself permission to imagine speaking in their voice if we had ever allowed them to tell us fully what they experienced, not just their victories and the things that they won and their accomplishments, but their pain and their anguish and the things that they felt too deep in their heart to share. And this is a section from um, the reimagining of the voice of Harriet Tubman. The visions were there in my head, right beside my name, my real name, woman, free. There were other visions too. You can't never stop seeing what you see when you lead men into battle, into an army raised up against you. I was the first woman to do that. It was a civil war, June, 1863, when I guided old James Montgomery and his colored soldiers up the Combahee River. We sent the Confederates scrambling and ended up setting free 700 of my people who had been enslaved. Still, all the praying I did ain't never yet taken away the faces of colored men in blue uniforms dying to be free. Dying with their faces shut off or begging for help they knew wasn't gonna come. Or seeing a field that had once grown corn or cotton now filled with the bodies of dead men, colored and white. After battle, watching pigs rooting through that field and eating what was left of them men, whether they were dead or alive. I dreamed about all that and I couldn't tell nobody about them dreams because anybody I'd tell, if they'd been in that war, I know they probably had a dream even worse than mine. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Marita. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and and I, I will say that this book couldn't have come along at a more important part of my life. I too am, you know, one of those anchor women, the, you know, now um, I'm called the matriarch of the family because I'm the oldest uh, surviving uh, uh, female. I have an older brother, but nobody calls him the patriarch. And, you know, this identity, this myth, this stereotype of the strong black woman is what people often call you when they're getting ready to put a burden on you that is almost impossible to bear. Uh, the strong black woman is maybe what I would consider a positive stereotype, you know, kind of like black people can dance and uh, Asians are good at math and, and uh, that kind of thing. But regardless of whether a stereotype is thought to be positive or affirmative, it is dangerous. So how has this stereotype um, affected um, Black women in, in, in negative ways? Well, I'm very proud to say I'm a strong Black woman. It's just that my definition of strength is now enlarged. And my definition of strength includes, I can ask for help, I can say no, and um, I can take time for myself. Like a lot of oppressed groups, we took the language and the imagery that was designed to diminish us and turn it into something positive. For example, as women, we were not even considered once we, when we were enslaved to be women. You couldn't rape a enslaved black woman because that would assume that she had honor, that she had chastity. We were not considered women, we cons were considered chattel. And in response, we developed a sense of, okay, if whatever you throw at us, we can survive because we had no time to do anything else but survive. We had no time because the assaults were very relentless, continuous in a way that even surpasses the, what we talk about micro and macro aggressions today. So that, as I said, that, that ideology, that has really served us. But now we live in a world that's very different than the world of our mothers and fathers. We live in a world that has been shaped by the civil rights movement, feminism, 
the women's movement, Oprah Winfrey and the ways in which she brought everything out of the closet and made it okay to talk about our deepest fears and what we considered our deepest shame. And so we now have this whole language where we can look at our experience and say, well, you know, yeah, I'm a strong black woman, but I do think that sometimes I should be able to sit down. I do think that sometimes I should be able to say no. And we now know that that one of the problems with the strong black woman complex is it, it disempowers the people around us. When we're always so eager to take on any burden, the people around us, they don't develop their own strength. They don't develop their own resilience. We take others to the doctor when they're in pain, but we will have to be in mid stroke, gasping for breath before we will finally go to the emergency room because we have this idea in our head that the family will fall apart if we go to the emergency room. And so what it does is yes, it makes us strong, but it corrupts in a lot of very diverse and insidious ways, our relationships with other people around us and particularly our relationship with ourselves. Uh, Dr. Audrey Chapman, uh, a very prominent therapist down in Washington DC said to me that the black woman is the most neglected woman in America. She's neglected by her family. She's neglected by herself. And so those of us who are now interrogating the strong black woman complex are trying to create a new language. And this is gonna be generational so that I'm gonna to have to talk to my daughter-in-law. She's gonna to have to talk to my granddaughter about changing the vocabulary so that we can save our lives because black women are dying disproportionately in part because we feel we have to be strong all the time. Um, Audre Lorde, the, the poet and, and um, writer, is famously quoted as saying, uh, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So what habits of self-care sustain you? Well, my life was marked, and I talk about this in the book by the fact that my father died of a heart attack when I was 20. No, my mother died of a stroke when I was 21. And my father died of a heart attack when I was 23. And they were in their early 60s. Now, this was before, you know, jogging and, you know, all of the things that we do now. But when I saw them die like that, I decided very early that I was going to outlive them that I wanted desperately to live much longer than my parents did. Their deaths haunted me and marked me for a very long time. And I didn't want any child that I had to suffer the loss of me at a very early age. And so I started in my twenties, um, experimenting with vegetarianism. I started meditating. Um, I do yoga. I have had a practice for many years of creating sister circles, uh, particularly if I'm in high stress situations like uh, a, a largely work, work, workplace um, to sustain me emotionally. I think I went to my, I had my first session with a therapist when I was uh, like in my early 30s or late 20s. And so all of those practices have sustained me. I do not have perfect health, but they have helped me to live a decade longer than my parents. And I see my doctor regularly. So those are the habits that have really helped me. And when I was doing the book, I talked to a lot of therapists and we talked about what they see in their practice with black women. And what they see is black women coming into their office in crisis, not having yet given themselves permission to feel the pain they feel. Black women coming into the office, they're on their cell phones. They can't even stop being on the cell phone long enough to actually start the session with the therapist. Black women who don't really in their heart of hearts believe that they have right to be happy or joyful. Black women who believe that joy and celebration is something for white women. 
because as women who are part of a community that is under assault 24 hours a day, micro and micro, we don't have time to be joyful. We don't have time to celebrate ourselves. And these are some of the beliefs that these therapists told me that they're, they're counteracting and, and teaching Black women to overcome. Um, Roxanne Gay uh, spoke, I believe it was in Bad Feminist, about the kind of emotional labor uh, that uh, Black women are often expected to to do not just in our families, but on our jobs. Um, in fact, she told a story that was very similar to a story that you uh, uh, told about how students, you know, sort of expect you to, or at least request uh, you to uh, nurture them in ways that they may not necessarily ask. Um, you know, a white male professor, or maybe even a white woman uh, professor, um, so much so that, you know, you are, find yourself being a therapist and a mother and a counselor. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the, the question, how do we, so you, you kind of redefine and, and uh, reconceptualize this idea of, of a strong Black woman as the new strong Black woman. How do we begin to talk about this issue with the people in our lives, whether it's our family, um, our co-workers, um, our students, um, uh, our, our men and our loved ones, and, and especially the young women in our family who are um, you know, doomed uh, to to continue this. No, they're not doomed. Let's not let's not put that out there. I think that one of the for me, I, I think it starts with us listening to our bodies and listening to our minds. What I find that sometimes is that African American women, you know, there's a, there's a phrase of the mind body connection. That is that you know you listen to your body. And it tells, there's a, the mind and the body are all one. We tend to think of the mind as separate from the body, but actually it's all one thing. And the mind and the body work together so that if I'm in emotional pain, my body is gonna feel physical pain. But I find sometimes with black women that we suffer from the mind body disconnect. That is, we have censored are the voice of our bodies. We've said to them, be quiet, shut up. I've got to deal with my son. I've got to deal with my family. I know I feel like I'm having a heart attack, but be quiet. And so I think one of the things that just starts with listening to your feelings. What are you actually feeling? Are you feeling pain? Are you feeling yearning, desire? and acknowledging the legitimacy of whatever it is you feel. And that for many women, that's, a, that's something entirely new, absolutely new. And they may find that in order to start that, they may need to seek out therapy. They may need to talk to a close and trusted friend who they see as someone who sets boundaries, as someone who seems to be balanced and content and happy and talk to them about how they do it. But it's a lot of it is just, what do you feel? Slow down, slow down and listen to your feelings. Um, one of the reasons we don't want to slow down is a lot of times if we slow down and take a breath and take time for ourselves, that space will be filled with the demons, the darkness, the fear that we have yet to address. So we keep busy, we dance as fast as we can so that those demons and that darkness can't overtake us. And these are, these are things that are very, very deep. But I, for, with me, the first thing I would tell a woman, how do you feel? And if you are feeling 
bad, strange, um, unhappy, stressed, do something about it because your life depends on it. And when I've done these types of programs, it's been enormously satisfying to read in the chat where people will say, thank you just for saying that. No one ever said to me that I have the right to set boundaries. No one ever said to me that I have the right to say no. And so these are basic, very basic things, but they're foundational um, principles of self-care. I thought that you were very, you know, sort of open and honest and transparent about your own life and your own struggles and your own uh, challenges as you grappled with this idea of the strong black woman. Um, what, what did you learn about yourself as you researched and wrote this book? Well, what I learned is that, that for, okay, I'll talk back in and then I'll answer that. What, what started the book is that I had a kind of a incident over one weekend where I felt like I was having a stroke. I wasn't having a stroke, but I just felt dizzy. I was exercising as normal, doing everything as normal, but my blood pressure was high and I felt dizzy. When I went to the emergency room, my blood pressure went down. They did all the tests, couldn't find anything wrong with me. When I went to my internist, he said, hmm, let's get an MRI. And the MRI revealed that sometime in the distant past, I'd had two silent strokes. Now a silent stroke is just that. I could be having a silent stroke right now, no indication, bam, but it is killing brain cells. And they are actually way more common than lethal strokes. So many, many people have silent strokes. And so because I had erected this image of myself as this super strong black woman, when I found out that I'd had these two silent strokes, my image of myself literally crumbled. I wasn't supposed to have silent strokes. I had done everything right. What am I doing having strokes? But then I remembered my mother died of a stroke. My father died of a heart attack. And I cannot change my biology. I cannot change my genetic legacy. But if I had not rigorously and regularly devoted myself to a healthy lifestyle mentally and physically, those two silent strokes may have been fatal. So I had done a lot of good things, um, but there was still more that I could do. I've started, for example, in addition to walking, I hike. I have a group of women um, of a certain age and we hike once, once a month. And um, my doctor put me on, you know, a little addition to my, my, my meds. And so I've learned that it's not a destination, that it's not a destination, it's a journey. And that I'm going to be hopefully getting stronger and stronger even as I age. And I'm very proud of my gray hair. I'm proud of the lines in my forehead. I, lived, I wanted to live long enough to get all this. <laughs> and wear it well. <laughs> Although you have an, in the uh, 40 or more years that I've known you, you look exactly the same, um, you know, as you did 40 years ago. I'll take that. <laughs> and I guess that's all. Even though, all. <laughs> even, even though, it's, even though it's, of course it's not true. In fact, I'll say something about that. I think when I turned 50, you know, I did this crazy thing where I, I stripped naked and I stood in front of the mirror and I did this exercise where I looked at my body. I mean, I think that, for example, we don't often look at our bodies. We take a shower, we dry off, we put on the lotion, but we never really do an, a, a thorough examination of our bodies in which we are not upset because we have scars, marks, pimples. And I decided when I turned 50 that I was gonna do that. And I spent you know, about half an hour just looking at my body and you know all the things that I said I hated about them, my skinny legs, the bumps, the root. And I said, and I thank my body. You know, I thank my skinny legs for carrying me all these years. And I just thought how lucky I was 
to have this body. So I have a relationship with my body that's, that's very intense. I also have a relationship with what I call my inner Marita. Um, that I spend a lot of time practicing things like silence and meditation. And I've learned to listen to my inner Marita, who is my best friend. And she tells me instinctively what to do and, and how to figure things out. So I think that, you know, this body, these bodies are miraculous. They're amazing. And we can't, you know, wear them down like they're cars that never go to the, <laughs> they never get an oil change. <laughs> we have to really honor them because they really are quite, quite amazing. And I think that also another thing happened when I turned 50, when I turned 50, people started telling me that I was beautiful. You know, nobody had ever said that to me before. You know, they say, oh, you're nice looking. But people started telling me I was beautiful. And you know why? Because by the time I was 50, I, I had worked a lot on trying to accept myself. I'd worked a lot on trying to trust myself. I stopped wearing makeup and just put lipstick on and just, this is what you get. And I think that what people were seeing was the inner me. It was, they weren't responding to the out, they were responding to what was radiating. And I'm still trying to perfect that radiation. It's not perfect. I'm still trying to shine it up. That is so powerful, Marita. And you know, the, uh, the, just the act of examining your naked body in a full length mirror is something that I think most women don't do, or if we do Never, it, yeah. it, we're criticizing it. Yeah, you know? but I mean, oh. examine it with, with gratitude. Thank you. Yeah, maybe you are overweight, but you're still here. You served me. Your heart is, my heart is beating. <laughs> we never thank our bodies. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, so the, the um, you did a lot of research uh, for this book. You uh, spoke to um, everyday women as well as experts and activists and uh, thinkers. What is the biggest discovery that you learned and the biggest concern uh, that you uncovered based on, on the research that you did and the stories that you heard? Well, the consensus around Black women's health is that we need to monitor our health. We need to get our butts into the doctors regularly. We need to see a therapist if we need to and not be afraid of that, even if our mothers tell us that that's a sign of weakness. But to, if, it, if I summed up, I asked one of the cardiologists that I talked to in the book, and I said, what is the one thing you would tell Black women to do? She said, move. I would tell them to move. I would tell them to start exercising, to walk, to move in ways that support health because black women don't do enough. We're always moving. I mean, my God, we're constantly moving, but we're not always moving in ways that are designed to reinvigorate us and support the, the natural health of our bodies. So move. And then when I talked to the therapist, I said, what's the one thing you would tell black? He said, slow down, mm. slow down. That is take five minutes out of your day. And, and one of the therapists said, she told a client, I want you to take five minutes a day and just do nothing, just close your eyes. And she said, five minutes, I can't take five minutes. She, this person could, did not have five minutes in her day. She imagined that she didn't have five minutes a day, that she could take just for herself. So moving and slowing down, breathe. Um, Try to fill your day with little tiny pockets of joy. Close your door, even if you have to lock yourself in the bathroom, just breathe. Off limits, my time, me time, downtime. So slow down and move. And also recognize that you have a right to joy. That's uh, um, probably, as, as uh, Audre Lorde said, one of the most revolutionary acts um, that you can do for yourself, you know, allowing yourself those moments of joy. And a lot of times people in our families really do want to 
see us rest. But because we're always telling them that we don't need to rest, they take that as gospel. I mean, I, I, I joke about how in the black community on Mother's Day, everybody's rushing to go out and buy some cheap balloons and five dollar flowers for grandma and mom. When the most significant thing they could do is during the year, ask grandma, what can I do for you? Do you need anything? And not wait for Mother's Day or their birthday to buy balloons and five dollar flowers. But we, if we never, if we never legitimize sitting down, asking for help, we haven't trained our families and our loved ones to do that. When my husband was struggling with um, cancer many, many years ago, uh, I was his primary caretaker, and his family would call every day. You know, how's Joe? The first thing was, how's Joe? How's Joe? That was the first thing. Not even hello, how's Joe? And I began to feel deeply isolated, overwhelmed, uh, disrespected. And this isn't a family that thinks I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, okay. But this family still never asked me, how are you doing? So I asked my, I told my mother-in-law, I said, look, you guys call, you never ask how I am. And I'm bearing the primary weight. Yeah, you guys help out, but it's mostly on me. Well, don't you know from that point on, Marita, what do you need? How can we help? How are you? But I had to train them. I had to ask. And once I asked, I got it. Yeah, that role as the caregiver um, is such a, a difficult one because it is so hard for the caregiver to get care. You know, when, when uh, she or he, but it's usually a woman, is giving care to a loved one. Um, why don't we open it up for questions? Um, the uh, Q&A um, button, which is at the bottom uh, left-hand part of your screen, uh, you can click on that and enter your, um, your questions for Marita and uh, Katie will field those questions and um, let's yeah. get into it. All right, so Marita and Sandra, I have one up for you already. Um, and I think it's a really good one. Uh, do you feel that there is a correlation between women who feel they need to be strong and ending up in relationships that are unhealthy because they feel they should be strong enough to support or fix the relationship? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I used to be one of those repair women, too. Um, that is, I was drawn to men who needed to be fixed. And the great thing I thought was that, you know, it, 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 it reinforced my idea that I was strong, that I was capable. And so if I could fix this man, um, everything would be okay. The problem with that is if you've got to fix him, he may be in need of permanent repair. And when I was in therapy to discuss this, um, my therapist said, well, you know, what's happening is you're choosing men who actually are a psychic reflection. You may think you're so strong, but they actually reflect your weaknesses. And you're now, I, in fact, I say in the book that I was half a woman looking for half a man. When I got clear about um, being healthy in myself, I was a whole woman looking for a whole man, and that's what I found. But many, many women, particularly Black women, are addicted to repairing men because it makes you feel so, so strong. That man needs you. And the fact that he needs you raises your self-esteem, you think. Yeah, there's so many women who uh, I've met who say, uh, you know, I don't understand it. Why am I attracting uh, mates, you know, or partners, you know, who have this overwhelming uh, need? And I think the question is more is why do you let them in? You know, because needy people will come to whoever. He's also needy. He's also yeah. needy. You're, you're, you're attracting what you are. It's just, it's just in, a, in a different disguise. 
I think that what you said about Marita about, you know, you're a half person attracting other half people. And when you were whole, you found another whole person's particularly poignant. Um, I have another one um, in a slightly different vein, very different track. Um, earlier, you mentioned your granddaughter. Um, and I'm curious, I don't know if she's of age yet to read this book or, or how old she is, but um, <laughs> she's she... 15 months. <laughs> okay, she's, she's got some time. <laughs> but her, her fourth word was book. <laughs> so she's already she's already on the way. Um, I'm curious when she is ready to read this book in maybe 15 more years, um, what do you hope that she takes away from it? Well, I actually have, this is my, my biological granddaughter. I have two step granddaughters, oh. uh, one who's 25 and the other is, is 10. And, and I hope what they take away from the book when they read it is that they have a right to joy and that they have a right to, to be strong, but also to be vulnerable. For example, one of the most meaningful conversations I had recently is with um, one of the women who's, who's profiled in the book. And I connected with her after the book came out. And she told me that her partner had died recently, had died during the lockdown. He was about 30 something and um, it was very tragic. He went to the hospital during the early days of COVID and you know, just it was a madhouse. Like he, they give him aspirin said go home. Three days later, he was really in distress. She's driving him to the hospital and he dies in the passenger seat on the way to the hospital. And she had a child with him and she had a 12 year old daughter and the daughter was very close to him as well as, you know, there was his son. And she said to me, she said, she immediately got the daughter and her in therapy. And she said, she cried in front of her daughter. She said, I didn't cry the Amazon river, but I cried the Potomac. I let her see my tears. And so that she knew it was okay to cry and we comforted each other. And in my own family, one of my husband's nieces recently lost her father. She's 10. And when I asked her about her feelings and crying, she said, I haven't cried. I'm holding it in. Now, she is in a different situation where there are severe economic issues that weigh on the family. The mother is under enormous stress with a lot of kids and not the kind of support she needs. And so when the niece told me this, I realized that whenever I'm around her, that I have to have conversations with her about the importance of showing her emotions, that she doesn't have to keep her emotions in, that it's okay to cry. So that I think that when we are in the presence of young people who are, who are asking for help like that, we have to tell them, show your emotions. There's nothing wrong with that. If the adults in their lives have not had that conversation, you can have that conversation with them. Wow. Um, oh, wow. We've got some more good questions, um, at least two more. So when first establishing boundaries with friends and family who have always seen you as the strong one, uh, what do you suggest as the first step you take in setting those boundaries? Well, you have to, the first step is to get clear in your own mind that you deserve to set boundaries. That you, that you are ready to set boundaries. The worst thing you can do is set a boundary, meet resistance as you will. And they say, okay, there's a great book I've read called, um, my answer is no, if that's okay with you. Okay, so the answer has to be no, whether it's okay with you or not. Now, we're not gonna say no to our mother, you know, our sister and sister the same way. There are ways to negotiate no. There's ways to start having conversation before you ever have to say no. And so they say, well, you know, my job is increasing. I have a whole new set of responsibilities. 
I know that in the past up to now, I've been available, but I'm not gonna be available going forward. But I still wanna help you, but I need you to understand, yeah, 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 yeah. The resistance that you're gonna get is absolutely inevitable. And the fear that we often have is that, oh my goodness, if I say no, they're gonna be so mad with me, they'll never, oh, they'll get over it. Or that they'll fail, you know, they'll crumble. Yes. You know, they yeah. won't be able to, right. to function. Right. Um, they, they, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. You know, you can say, well, you know, I can, I can, I can get you started on Google looking up a solution. You know, um, I can't do two Saturdays. I can do one. Um, actually, you know what? I had planned to take that day off for myself. Hello. And you have to see, that's why the, it's not really what others say is what you believe. So if you believe that you deserve this, you can, re, you can stand up in the face of, yeah, 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 yeah. And you can learn how to negotiate. And I do, if you're serious about learning to say no, as I said, there's a, a great book. Um, my answer is no if it's okay with you by Dr. Nanette Gattrell. And there's a whole lot of books out there that will really guide you through this. Talk to your friends who, who know how to say no. Ask them how they do it. And realize that your family does love you. They'll, 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 they'll learn. And I think that a family that really loves you will actually be glad to see you in the end, down the line, they will be glad to see you that you're taking time for yourself. I think that's wonderful. Um, one other one, a totally different direction uh, for both of you. Did your pathway just happen uh, or did you have to press or struggle to choose your way of life? Sandra, you wanna go ahead? Well, if, if by that question you mean, you know, how do I, um, negotiate this strong black woman uh, myth, I think I'm still a work in progress. Um, it's something that um, I am learning to figure out, but you know, rather late in life. And you know, uh, I, Marita, I think you said this earlier, there's a certain sort of um, a pride or egoism in being the strong one and being the stable one and being the helper. Um, so that, that's something that I've had to, you know, to release that, you know, I, I'm not the center of the world and I am not the solver of everybody's problem. And, you know, uh, regardless if it's a friend or a family member or, you know, acquaintances who are, uh, reaching out to, to me for things that they need, which I'm not in a position to, to supply. I, I feel okay with, you know, saying that either they'll figure it out for themselves or they'll go to the next person. And, you know, maybe the next person will be able to help them in ways uh, that I'm unable to. So this, you know, this path is, is, is a, um, it, it, it's, it's a constant, um, act of, you know, uh, reinvention and, and uh, affirmation and, and, and being aware. I was the oldest daughter in a family of four, and I had responsibilities that I wasn't the oldest sibling. I was the oldest daughter. I had, you know, responsibilities that my brother exactly did not have. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. So I was a seven-year-old <laughs> uh, kid changing diapers. Exactly. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, fry. Well, I wasn't frying fried chicken. chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, these are, you know, you know, sixty years later, this this role of you know being the the helper, being and now they call me the matriarch is one that you know I'm still figuring out how to adjust in ways that make sense for me. What about you, Marita? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. Um, and that's what's so interesting. 
And that's what's so actually fulfilling that there is so much more, you know, to learn, um, you know, about setting boundaries and, and, and celebrating myself. And, but I think that what I saw, you know, with, with, with my parents dying like that, that was a, it was a very, very cruel thing. But at the same time, I, because I was their child and they had raised me in a certain way, it was sort of a springboard for a new kind of knowledge, you know? And so um, I miss my parents every day and I feel like I'm living my life for them, for them in a way. But yeah, it's, it's a continuous, continuous. I mean, and writing the book, I've learned so much from having conversations with women. In fact, I've, I'm working on a workbook to go along with the book because many women have asked me, well, you know, what do you do? What kinds of practices? And so it's a book where I talk about and delineate some of the practices that, that have served me and have served a lot of other people as well. All right. Well, I'll put out a last call for questions. If there are any more, um, please enter them in the Q&A now. But uh, Marita, I think we will all be looking forward to that workbook coming out um, as a companion to this book. That's wonderful. I'm very glad to hear that. I just wanted to direct those of those, those who've joined us uh, to my website, maritagolden.com, where they will find my blog, uh, my bookstore, as well as information on the workshops, the writing workshops that I have coming up. Absolutely. And if you go to our event page, you've got a link straight to Marita's website. Um, and we've got some links to Sandra as well. So please check those out. And I think that may be it for this evening. Oh, we got one more question, uh, but I more a comment. Thank you both. Um, and that's from our, our board president who's also on. So thank you both so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation and um, we really appreciate it. And um, just a refresh. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Marita. And thank you, Katie and Jeffrey and everyone mm -hmm. at the yeah. Beautiful Love Foundation for making this uh, event possible and um, you know allowing us to discuss an issue that is you know, the expression is when America gets a cold, black people get pneumonia, something yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, you know, yeah. these are issues that affect us all to a certain degree. And this uh, book, I think, can be instructive to us all in figuring this out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got copies here. If you're in Winchester locally, you can go uh, right to the Winchester Book Gallery and pick it up. Um, go to Marita's website, um, and she's got links there as well. So um, really a wonderful read. And so thank you so much, everybody. And uh, this, if you if people weren't able to make it, if you'd like to share this with somebody, um, we should be posting the live video in the next few days um, up on our site. We'll be sharing that with Marita and Sandra as well. Um, so if you'd like to share this, this conversation, you can do so. And thank you all again. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.